Well, hello, friends. Welcome to Fifth Avenue Sunday School Hour and our second session on the book of Zechariah. We'll be looking at Zechariah 2 today, and we're going to find that we really are a part of God's story as we look through this. But before we begin, would you join me in prayer? Precious Father, God of hope, God of healing, we bow before you, thanking you for your gift of love and comfort, for peace and caring. Father, thank you for being with us in the good times and the hard times. Please open our hearts to your message today. Help us to focus on you and to recognize you and all that goes on in our lives because we know you are forever present. Teach us, we pray, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Grammy and her five-year-old granddaughter were visiting the card store looking for birthday cards. When Grammy looked up over the card rack and there she saw a picture. It was a, a glass wall hanging and etched on that glass wall hanging was the word hope. And Grammy called to the sales clerk and said, could you take that picture down for me? And the sales clerk came over and said, certainly. And the little five-year-old granddaughter looked up at the sales clerk and said, Grammy collects hope. Well, the sales clerk took it down and the little granddaughter continued to babble on and on about all of the mugs and the pictures and the shirts and the pencils that Grammy had with hope written on them. And Grammy felt the etched glass and she held it out in front of her. She pulled it up close to her. <clears throat> and as she evaluated it, she knew she wanted it. So she looked at the price tag and the price was right. So she said to the sales clerk, I'm going to take this. And the sales clerk said, great, I'll take it to the register and wrap it for you. You continue your shopping. Well, it wasn't long and the sales clerk came back and apologetically she said, I broke the picture. And Grammy said, I want to see. And she went to the register with the sales clerk and there was a crack down the side of the etching. And Grammy stood there just a brief while before she said, it's okay, I'm going to take it and I'm going to hang it on my wall and it will remind me that hope still exists even when there's brokenness. And you know, I think that's what Zachariah is telling his people as we study his word this week that hope still exists because if you remember, the Jewish remnant has come back from Babylon, from captivity, and it's just Jerusalem is a place of devastation. The weeds have overtaken it. There are people there that they don't even know that have inhabited the land. The temple is uh, in ruins. There are no businesses. Everything is in shambles. There's just nothing left. And so today, when we look at the third vision given to Zechariah in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, I think we'll likely see that despite the brokenness of the Jewish remnant, there is hope. So will you open your Bibles and read with me Zechariah 2? verses one through five, and we'll just take one little bite at a time as we look at God's word today. I'll give you time to find it. Zechariah two, one through five. And Zechariah's doing the talking here. I looked up and saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then I asked, 
where are you going? He answered me to measure Jerusalem, to see what its width and what is its length. Then the angel who talked with me came forward and another angel came forward to meet him. And that angel said to him, run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited like villages without walls because of the multitude of people and animals in it. For I will be a wall of fire all around it, says the Lord, and I will be the glory within it. Well, don't you think those people listening to Zechariah had a raised eyebrow? Don't you think they were a little bit skeptic when they looked around and all they saw was total devastation, heartbreak and hurt? Don't you think they began to wonder about Zechariah? But Zechariah, this is the first glimmer of hope that Zechariah offers. He's urging them to think big, dream big dreams. He's planning a picture in their minds that they could otherwise never have imagined. He's trying to change their focus from the circumstances they see themselves in to what could be. He says there will be a Jerusalem with no walls. We don't need the surveyor to measure. Jerusalem's going to be a vast place. It's going to be bustling with activity it's going to be so big and so vast that walls can't contain it. It's going to be filled with God's glory. It's going to be filled with God's presence. It's going to be a busy place. There are going to be people and animals. Does this remind you of the cherubim? and the flaming swords in the Garden of Eden that protect the tree of life. God's glory is gonna be all around it, just like it was there. And then I was reminded of Elisha and the flaming chariots and the horses when he asked for God's presence. God's presence surrounds you and me in all kinds of shapes, forms, and fashions. And we have to have the courage to see and to dream the impossible dreams. Because left to our own devices, we remain stuck in a rut and unmotivated to change. We tell ourselves, Things just won't be getting any better. That's the way it is and we'll have to adapt. And that's the way it was with the remnant in Babylon. They just settled in and decided not to even give hope a thought. Until we look at verses six through seven, up, up. Flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Up, escape to Zion, you that live with daughter Babylon. Zechariah is saying there are more people still captive in Babylon, and they need to leave. They need to come back to their homeland. They need to inhabit their homeland. They need to begin to change their focus and see and feel God's presence. They had probably at that point in Babylon decided they were just going to nest there. They couldn't change a lot of things, but they knew the people around them. They knew the conditions around them and they'd grown to make themselves comfortable because they couldn't do any better. 
they were in a rut and they were enjoying being in a rut. So now Zachariah is saying, I've had this vision and you need to leave there. It's like the little frog in the kettle. You remember that story? The little frog sits comfortably in the kettle and the fire grows hotter and hotter until the water begins to boil and the frog never moves. He doesn't move because he's been there so long. That's the norm for him. He doesn't even realize he's in danger. It's easier to stay in the kettle than to risk hopping out and finding life elsewhere. The frog is doomed unless someone or something motivates him. And this is the way the people of Babylon were. They were doomed. This is where you and I find ourselves sometimes, unable to get out of our rut, content to stay where we are. And sometimes the memory of our God and what he can do fades away. But three times Jeremiah said to the people, up, it's time to get out of the kettle before it's too late. It's time for you to claim your heritage. You're my child. It's time for you to claim your calling as the people of God. It's time for you to take a leap of faith. It's time for you to shun the comfort and the opposition you face in Babylon. It's time for you to take a risk and head back to Judah. It won't be easy. They might fail. There will definitely be problems and difficulties along the way, but they'll be moving toward their God they'll be moving toward their true identity as a child of God. And they'll be moving toward their destiny, a home where God dwells. They're being called to leave their place of complacency, <clears throat> excuse me, and embrace the challenges of adventure. Why do they need to leave? Let's look at verse eight. For thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me regarding the nations that plundered you, truly, one who touches you touches the apple of my eye. <clears throat> they needed to leave because God was there. God was at their home and he was waiting for them. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. And that's certainly true of the captives. God loves them. He's going to deliver them. He says, you're the apple of my eye. A term of endearment, a term of affection. More than that, I found this week as I studied a translation and I had seen it many times before and it never stuck with me like it did this time. The apple of God's eye refers to the pupil of God's eye. You think about the pupil of your eye. When something touches you in the pupil, it hurts. You do more than blink. God loves us so much. that he cares about every small detail of our lives. We are the apple of his eye. Who's the apple of your eye? <clears throat> Is it a spouse? Is it a child? Is it a friend, a parent? What would you do for the apple of your eye? What did God do for the apple of his eye? He sent his only begotten son 
that whosoever believes in him should have everlasting life. God loves you that much that he sent his son to die for you. You are part of God's story. You are the apple of his eye. Those times when you doubt God's love, find a verse in his word that speaks to you of his unconditional love. Put it on a sticky note. Put it somewhere you'll see it. That you'll read it over and over until you truly believe it and you can rejoice in it. God's characteristics are made clearer as the vision continues. Let's look at verse nine. <clears throat> See, now I'm going to raise my hand against them and they will become plunder for their own slaves. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I will come and dwell in your midst, says the Lord. God's not a vengeful God. He's going to let Babylon deteriorate from within. Each time Babylon is mentioned in the Bible, it is in opposition to God. And you can follow it through the Old Testament and even in Revelation in the New Testament. God's not going to wreak havoc and destruction among the nations, but the absence of his influence may just lead them to go searching for what is missing. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. The dramatic return of the Lord to inhabit and rebuild his house is cause for praise for those who have returned to Judah. What a promise, what hope this vision is offering these people. <laughs> it probably has been a good time, a good while since these people have experienced God. <clears throat> and this vision that Zechariah gives helps you and me to know that there is a God-shaped hole in each of us. And we only experience hope when we return home to our God. Let's look at the last few verses. 12, the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all people, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling place. God will gather his people into the holy city of Jerusalem. God breaks down the barrier between Gentiles and Jews. Through the shed blood of Jesus, we are one. Zechariah reminds us that even when we feel isolated and abandoned by God, he never leaves us. He consistently moves towards us. He invites us to cling to hope. Hope exists despite brokenness. His protection is not violent. It's one of divine love. He offers us endurance. He doesn't offer us an escape. He doesn't promise life will be easy. He promises he will always walk beside us. Hope exists in the middle of our struggles because he's already there to protect us. I don't know about you, but the past year really brought God into focus for me. And especially one morning, a few weeks into the pandemic, I was feeling completely, totally defeated and very insecure. <clears throat> I was plagued by the what ifs. We were constant companions, what ifs and Gwen. One morning I became increasingly agitated as I stood in our doorway and I was paralyzed with fear <clears throat> and I prayed for peace. And nature beckoned to me. 
It was like God invited me into his classroom. As I walked, my fears began to subside. I looked at the budding trees and the shrubs. They assured me that God was going to bring newness. There was hope there for each of us. There were birds singing without a care in the world. And I was reminded, he takes care of the birds. He's going to take care of you and me as well. There was one little bird sitting perched on a limb that was lodged between two larger limbs. It had broken away from the trunk of the tree. That little bird was totally unaware. As he perched there singing, and as the wind began to blow, he moved to and fro, as if to say to me, God's got this. I'm comfortable in my brokenness because I know I'm protected by his spirit. As I walked, I smelled the fragrance of flowers. He fed my heart with anxious gifts and I was reminded that I was the fragrance of Christ to those who were saved and to those who were perishing. And in a time of hopelessness, I needed to be hope to a dying world. I challenge you this coming week, as you find yourself in less than desirable situations, to look for him. He's waiting for you, just as he's waiting for each of us to turn to him, to walk back into his presence, and to enjoy life with him. God bless you, dear friends, as you go through the coming week. Would you pray with me? God of hope, God of promise, thank you that you encamp around those who fear you and you promise to deliver them. Thank you for always making good on your promises. Amen. Have a great week, friends, and I'll see you next week, Lord willing, and we'll be looking at chapter five. So if you want to read ahead, we're in chapter five of Zechariah. God bless.